this is Tom Luce. I'm the CEO of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, and I want to thank you for joining with us today uh, to talk about uh, public release of some survey work that the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute partnered with Mike Besley's and Associates, a nationally recognized research organization to conduct a mental health survey among randomly selected Texas voters. And we'll be sharing our key findings with you the, today. Uh, our objectives in doing this were to measure the awareness and knowledge of mental health issues among Texans, um, to gauge if more or less uh, tension or more, more or less spending should be directed towards mental health issues insofar as the public's concerned, and then measure the correlation uh, of their attitudes about mental health to their feelings as to whether attention or resources need to be directed to these issues. Um, our mission at the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute is to identify and encourage the implementation of mental health policies and practices that enable Texans to get help when and where they need it. Uh, we're evidence-based, data-based, uh, and we want to make sure that people get the attention uh, they need when they need it and where they need it. A critical step towards this mission is understanding uh, the mental health landscape of Texas, which is why we uh, commissioned this survey. And the information will be available electronically after today's webinar. Uh, press kits will be sent to all attendees. And please note that the presentation is being recorded and we'll be posting it to our website on Monday, February 2nd for all to view. Um, based upon our conversations and our work the past year, we were formed um, in 2014 as um, we have established five key principles to guide our work. And therefore, before we discuss the findings of the survey, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andy Keller, who's our Executive Vice President of Policy and Programs, to share those principles with you. Andy? Well, thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks for being here today, folks. Uh, these five principles are really a distillation of uh, the policy priorities we're going to be focusing on in our work over the next several months at both the state and local levels. And the first one is really a very basic one that, that really encompasses our mission and our focus on really making sure that Texans get the care they need. And that's that Texans deserve behavioral health care that is accessible, understandable, efficient, and effective. And a lot of our policy work that we do at the state level is focusing on how do we, you know, improve and, and enhance the access to efficient and effective care. I think what you're going to see in these survey results is really the interplay between that and making care and care systems understandable to Texans and accessible. And we're going to see some real differences across different subgroups of Texans in terms of how understandable and accessible they see our systems. Our second point is that the state of Texas and its agencies have to be accountable to Texas taxpayers for the performance of behavioral health systems. This really interplays with the sunset work that's happening at the state, looking at the state health systems, and really the idea that there should be one point of accountability and authority at the state for behavioral health so we know who to go to um, and who to hold accountable for whether taxpayers are really getting the services they deserve. At the third level, our third point, um, which we'll pull up here on the screen, is recognizing that while the state has a role, they're not actually the ones that should be delivering health care services. Health care services, especially behavioral health, are delivered at local levels across this uh, very large and diverse state. And because of that, we need to increasingly promote policies that put accountability and flexibility and responsibility at the local system level and that encourages systems to work collaboratively because a lot of times Texans in need have needs that um, go beyond just mental health to include substance abuse, housing, employment, and we really need to think about how to make, uh, help people recover and, and come back to be uh, productive members of our communities. At the fourth level, um, really underlying all of this is the importance of performance evaluation and the, re the importance of having the data that we collect be both useful and meaningful and continuous because uh, it's not just about a one-time snapshot about whether things are working. It's really a a, you know, a multi-year process, an ongoing process of using data to learn, to better respond, to improve services so that we help folks um, recover. 
And then the fifth point that we are emphasizing and underlying all of this is that we have to have people to do the work. Um, right now, we believe that in the mental health area, the, our workforce situation is a public health emergency. We really don't have the numbers of Texans we need uh, you know, employed and trained to deliver behavioral health services, and we need to have a robust effort to both increase the numbers but also increase their skills. And you're going to see, again, need areas in the survey that speak directly to this. Before we get in, hand things over to Mike and, and talk about some of the, the, the details, I want to just highlight um, a few big findings from the survey that really for us define the mental health landscape in terms of how voters experience mental health needs and the mental health system. Um, one uh, big finding that Mike will give you a lot more detail on is that 67% of Texas voters believe that more state and local dollars should be spent on mental health. And we'll see some interesting dynamics in that group. It really cuts across party, it cuts across region, it cuts across um, uh, demographics. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real large number of our fellow Texans, Texas voters who believe this. Um, and you know, one thing I think that's closely related to that is people see this as a really important need. 76% of Texas voters have a close friend or family member that has experienced a mental health related issue, which is essentially the same percentage that would report a need in that same group for cancer um, and other you know, important health needs. So I think it's, it's something that impacts nearly all of us at some point in our life, um, most of us, the vast majority of us at any one time. Um, we also found that 31% of folks would not know where to go or who to contact for treatment. And we saw some really important dynamics underlying that that Mike will talk about that basically point out the, the more disadvantaged you are, the less education, the less income, the less likely it is you're going to know where to go. And that's a real problem. And then finally um, is the issue of how hard it is to talk about mental health needs. Nine out of ten Texans feel that it's harder to talk about a mental health condition than a physical health condition. And that's a barrier we need to work to overcome that we're working on here at the Mental Health Institute and something that Mike will be able to talk more about in detail. You know, and it's something that we've overcome before around breast cancer, around AIDS, and it's something that I think we can really, uh, you know, work together to use these findings to try to overcome. Um, there's other findings you'll see that Mike will get into, including, you know, information about how many Texans voters would uh, consider a career as a mental health professional. We'll hear more about that. So there's a lot of important findings, um, and we're, <coughs> excuse me, we'd like to have you too. Keep in mind that we're going to have a chance to discuss this at the end. We're going to let you use the, the question option. We're going to keep folks on mute just to kind of manage the numbers. But to have you post questions to us, you can type them into the question box. We'll see them here, and Mike will see them, and we can either talk more about the detail of the survey findings or about what we're trying to do here at the Mental Health Institute to address those findings, um, and we look forward to your questions at the end. But right now what I'm going to do is hand things over to the, uh, the person behind all this data who did a wonderful job getting this for us, uh, Mr. Mike Basilis. Mike, uh, we're going to give you the control and uh, let you sort of provide some more detail on these uh, important survey findings. And Mike, it may be that you're on mute. I don't know because we're not hearing you. I, I was on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I know that feeling. I, I, you can sense well, it. Well, then I can thank you again, Andy, for turning over the controls to me. And I was about to, I was saying that I will go at a fairly brisk pace, but there'll certainly be time to go back at the end of the presentation and ask me anything that you want to ask me or Andy or anyone else. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll plow ahead and uh, start going through this data of 802 voters that we interviewed in August. The margin of error to the results is 3.5%. In some places in this presentation, we're going to share with you some of the results from our June survey, which is our first glance or, or look at the attitudes of Texas voters regarding this issue. The questionnaire format that we use uh, is very similar to many of the issues that we delve into, and, and we start out with broad topics and making sure uh, screening for voters. Then we go through some general questions. And as we go through the survey, we get more and more specific as we work through the data. Uh, eventually, we get through some statements about mental health issues to see what will change, if anything, one's opinion about the uh, need to spend more or less state and local dollars on mental health. And we found out there were certain uh, statements that we presented that uh, correlated more highly uh, than others. Uh, nevertheless, you're going to see when we get to the statements, the agree-disagree statements, and should we spend more or less statements, 
that there are large majorities of uh, responses to a number of the uh, statements that we provided. Uh, I use regression analysis to look at the correlations between the statements as independent variables and where respondents went between the initial and informed positions. Of course, we conclude most of our surveys uh, with uh, key demographics. As Annie mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, income, uh, race and ethnicity. We even have partisanship in here. Uh, so it's a lot of different ways that we looked at this data, and I'm going to share some of the highlights and differences with you. Uh, one of the things that we do do is control for uh, the number of interviews that are conducted in each region of the state. 30% of our respondents uh, were interviewed in the Dallas-Fort Worth market because 30% of voters come from the Dallas-Fort Worth media market. A fourth come from the Houston media market. We put Austin Bryan College Station together. Uh, San Antonio, South Texas, and El Paso are put together, mostly because of demographic similarities. I know El Paso is kind of out there on an island, and you can say, why isn't that in West Texas? But I do put it with South Texas and San Antonio's media markets because of the demographic similarities and the high percentage of Hispanic voters that exist in those areas. West and East Texas aren't making up that many interviews uh, compared to 20 years ago. We have more and more uh, voters living in the triangle from Houston to Dallas, San Antonio, Austin uh, than ever before. And uh, we only have about one out of seven interviews are conducted in West Texas or East Texas. Another way that we can look at the data is to look at the uh, divide between what we classify as rural counties versus urban suburb suburban counties. And those counties in yellow that you see are the urban suburban counties. And that's where we see about four out of seven voters residing. We also ask some key questions about where they get their information. And for those in the media who may find this interesting, uh, TV news, their doctor, the newspaper, so forth, uh, we see that multiple uh, areas are used to get information about health care. Um, TV news, one's doctor, and the Internet tend to be very, very key sites. Fourth on the list are uh, you'd see newspaper as the most or next most preferred site. But what we do see when we look at the demographics by age are some differences. Social, social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter, more likely to be a source that is preferred by younger voters than by older voters. But as age increases, so does the likelihood that the newspaper would be a source of information about health care. And then um, as age decreases, we also see that there's a greater likelihood that one would go to the Internet sites. Now, one of the questions that we save for the end of the survey, after we had the respondents very warmed up to the issue of mental health, was to ask very specific, uh, maybe somewhat personal in nature, if they had any close friends or family members who ever experienced any of the following. 76% said that they had a close friend or family member who has experienced cancer. 75% uh, knew a family member or close friend who had arthritis. Depression was right behind those two at 62%. Hearing loss, 56%. And the reason why the ones are in blue and depression is in pink is we gave some more physical characteristics mixed in with mental health-related issues. So there's four in blue that we have, including dementia and Alzheimer's. Now, I know that does impact the brain, but we decided to term that as a fit more physical or not a mental health necessarily condition. Um, uh, mental illness was 42%. Substance abuse, we highlighted it beyond pink. We put that in red. 35% anxiety or fears that prevent one from fully functioning. Bipolar disorder, manic depression, 34%. Suicidal thoughts, 27%. Another uh, very, uh, very serious situation. Post-traumatic stress disorder, 25%. And schizophrenia, 13%. What we wanted to do was to look at the six in pink and see how many of the respondents would say, that they knew a close friend or family member who had at least one of these conditions. Um, and when we did that, we found that 74% of the respondents mentioned at least one of those six conditions in pink. When we threw in the substance abuse and the suicidal thoughts, two more conditions, we found that 76% of the respondents mentioned at least one of the eight conditions in pink or red. And throughout the rest of this presentation, we may separate out those in the 76% who mentioned one of these eight conditions from the 24% who don't have any familiarity or did not admit to us that they had a close friend or family member with one of those eight conditions. They could have had some other mental health condition, but not one of the eight that we mentioned. When we look at this across some of the uh, demographic subgroups, we see some things that are interesting. Younger respondents, whether they live in urban, suburban areas or rural areas, are a little bit above average in terms of the number of mentions that they will give us 
from the previous list. Four to eight mentions was uh, 45 to 48 percent of the uh, voters under the age of 55. We also see that as income increases, particularly with when we hit the $70,000 annual household income mark or higher, that we are above average in terms of the number of mentions. And females under the age of 55 were much more likely than males 55 or older to say they knew close friends or family members who experienced some of these conditions. We asked, going back to the beginning of the survey, if the respondents had seen or heard anything recently about mental health. Half the time we threw in in our split sample design, have they seem to have heard anything about mental health issues. Overall, it averaged out to 41%. We had 43% say that they had seemed to have heard something about mental health issues. 38% had seemed to have heard something recently about mental health, again, averaging out to 41%. Higher education levels, older uh, voters in general were above the average, and those who mentioned that they knew a close friend or family member with one of those eight conditions or more were a little bit above the average by three points. Younger respondents, those who had no uh, mentions of the eight conditions were below the average in terms of having seen or heard something recently. And it stands to reason. If I have a close friend or family member who has depression or some other mental health related condition, then there's a good chance I've seen or heard something recently because my antenna tends to be up and it's paying more attention to what's going on in those fields. We asked the same battery of questions in June and we had 41% in June say the same senior or her type of response. Uh, and you can see demographically there's more similarities here between the subgroups from June to the August survey. We also asked a battery of questions where we asked the respondent to tell us if they thought the state of Texas was doing an excellent, good, fair, or poor job half the time. We read it poor, fair, good, or excellent job, addressing each of the following issues. And we're going to have these in descending order of they're excellent minus poor. Uh, you don't want a negative number, but the state is receiving a minus 44% rating when it comes to handling the issue of illegal immigration. Uh, the reason I tend to look at the outside extremes is because I've seen another survey work that those who give a fair rating, for example, the job a governor is doing, uh, half of those individuals approve of the job the governor is doing and half disapprove because I asked the approval disapprove question along with the excellent good fair poor rating type of question. So put the good and fair off to the side and look at just the excellent and poor and you can see that voters do not, do not think the state is doing a very good job at all handling illegal immigration. When it comes to mental health issues, that's at a minus 28. 31 percent think the state is doing a poor job, 3 percent an excellent job. So there's a good deal amount of work that can be done here. We asked the same question in June, and in the June survey, it was a little bit worse. It was 33% poor, 2% excellent for a minus 31 rating. One of the big issues that the state is dealing with, uh, particularly now as we enter this legislative session, is going to be education. And you might want to know where mental health issues stacks up in terms of the job the state is doing with public education. It's right with it. Uh, public education is minus 26. Now there's more good and fair ratings here and less unsure, but there's still a negative, uh, net negative rating of minus 26 points. Water issues, they came in at minus 19 and transportation minus 16. So you can say, looking at this chart, that the job that the voters think the state of Texas is doing handling mental health issues is very similar to the way they view the way the state is handling public education. We also asked the question in June whether or not the respondent thought it was harder for people to talk about a mental health condition or situation than a physical health issue. And 88% said yes, they thought it was. Uh, what's interesting is when you look down at the, uh, uh, the list that we have, we see more individuals saying that they have, uh, uh, who, ha who have some familiarity with one of the mental health conditions saying yes than those who don't have any familiarity or a close friend or family member with a mental health condition. And, um, but regardless, 80 to 90 percent, whether you have experience or not, think that the, uh, it's harder to talk about mental health issues. And this is one of the barriers and, uh, that we have to overcome. We have to break down the stigma associated with discussing mental health and be able to get to the point where we can talk about it like it's cancer or anything else. 67 percent of the respondents said that they thought more state or local tax dollars or money, which we split sampled, should be spent addressing mental health needs and situations. Again, another split sample. 
13% thought the state and uh, local tax dollars should be uh, less should be spent. It doesn't matter whether or not we use the words tax dollars or money, needs or situations. We're getting the same two-thirds responses all the way across. So clearly, by a large margin, uh, voters in Texas think more needs to be spent in this area. Looking at some of the subgroups that we have here, we can see some, uh, some things. We see that even a majority of Republican primary voters, which I know from the work I've done in partisan politics, tend to be a little bit tougher when it comes to wanting to spend money than our, their Democrat counterparts, are, are the same way here. But regardless, even though there's a 30 point differential, a majority of Republican primary voters think more needs to be spent. And the less is only at 16%. There may be a little bit more uncertainty uh, and depends type of answers with Republicans than there are with Democrats. Um, we also see the same thing for those that vote solid Republican in general elections and, or solid Democrat in general elections. Also, at the very bottom of this table, we see that as the number of mentions increase in terms of the conditions that one has experience with with a close friend or a family member, so does the need to spend more money. And if you know someone, if you've seen firsthand a mental health condition, by 20 points, you're more likely uh, at 75% over the 56% to say more needs to be spent relative to one who does not have any experience uh, with, with the same. Now, we also asked another question. Have mental health situations ever impacted your family or workplace? We asked this question earlier on in the survey. Unlike the eight conditions that we used to develop that, that variable, uh, we asked a very simple question early on without getting specific about the types of conditions. And we found out that 53% of respondents said that uh, mental health situations have impacted their family or workplace. What's interesting is there's almost a 20 point differential between the responses of those that have postgraduate degrees versus those that don't have any college experience at all. We found similar results in our, in our June survey. One of the things that you would expect is for those that have told us at the end of the survey that they had experience with a close friend or family member with one of those conditions, they're more likely at 62% than those who didn't mention any of those conditions at 27% to say mental health situations have impacted their family or workplace. Now, you may wonder, if they didn't have any of those mentions at the end of the survey, then why would they even answer this question 11 in the affirmative? Because uh, we're asking about very specific conditions at the end of the survey. Another condition could have been something that they're thinking about when they answer this question. And they could have seen, uh, when we say, for example, has the mental health situation ever impacted your workplace? It may not be a close family member or friend. It could be an employee that, that they're thinking about uh, impact in the workplace in which they work in this question. So we, we came at this a couple different ways. We asked if the respondent would know where to go or who to contact for proper help or treatment regarding a mental health condition or situation for a family member. And 66% said that they would. We had 31% said so they did not know where to go and just a few percent that were unsure. What we see here is that there's a great difference between Anglos and minority respondents. It's a statistically significant difference, uh, to say the least. Um, we saw an increase in the answers of where they thought they needed to go among Hispanics between June and September, uh, but a decrease among African Americans. Looking beyond race and ethnicity, we see some things in this particular table and that is as income increases or the educational level increases, so does the likelihood that one would know where to go. So those that are at the greatest disadvantage in terms of knowing where to go to get the proper help or treatment tend to be those with relatively lower incomes, relatively lower educational levels. We also asked a follow-up to this question uh, that I'll just briefly mention, and that is when we asked, well, where would you go? Uh, we had a whole variety of answers. Uh, the number one answer was 20% so they would go to their the family doctor or a doctor. 9% was the next highest answer after that. They would go to some kind of a clinic. 8% talked about going to counselors or psychologists. 6% would go to a hospital. Uh, some would go to a pastor or another family member. So uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, individuals going all over the place trying to get the proper help or treatment they need. We weren't very specific on the type of condition or situation. We just labeled it, as you see in this question, a mental health condition or situation. 
So there's no one source that voters are telling us that they would go to if they needed help. If you owned a business, would you hire someone with a mental health illness that we said half the time had been treated successfully or is being treated successfully? No difference in the responses. We're finding four out of five voters in Texas uh, are very forgiving and, and, and they're very accepting of a mental health situation that's being treated. We don't have a similar question, though, to let you know what it would have been had we asked, uh, would you hire someone with a mental health illness or condition? Um, we certainly threw in about it being treated or had been treated successfully. Um, and we're on either side of 80%, depending on the educational level. Now, we also asked uh, today so many people change careers to become involved in work that positively impacts or improves people's lives. Have you ever, uh, or would you ever consider becoming a skilled mental health medical professional or caregiver? 33% of the respondents said that they would. Now, when you think about that 33% and project it out to the registered voters in the state, we're looking at over 3.5 million individuals, voters, that would consider or have considered becoming a mental health professional. Uh, the disconnect is, while there's an interest and consideration in the area of mental health professions, we don't have enough people going in that direction. And that's something that we have to work on in the future is to get uh, the interest to match the, uh, the need uh, and the demand. Uh, minority individuals are more likely than Anglos to give this consideration. We also see that there's one age group that stands out above the average, and 45% of the 45 to 54-year-olds are more likely to give this consideration. Democrats are more likely than our Republicans, and if you have experience with some of these mental health conditions, you are more likely at 38% at the bottom of the table than the 26% who don't have any experience with close friends or family members having one of those conditions. Um, also, if you've seen or heard something about mental health related issues recently, you're 11 points more likely than those who have not seen anything recently about this issue to give consideration to the mental health field. We also asked a question uh, for the respondents if, they're, if you have children or grandchildren, then would you ever consider encouraging them to look into this profession? And 65% said yes. Uh, they would consider encouraging them to look into this field. Again, we're finding minority respondents more apt than Anglo respondents but uh, to answer in the affirmative, but we have a majority of all subgroups in the affirmative. And this is another good sign that the encouragement's there, uh, but again, there's a disconnect between encouragement and getting people actually into the field. And look here, there's a 17-point difference between those who don't have any experience and those who have experience a family member or a close friend with one of those eight conditions we mentioned earlier. All the way around, there's nothing like having experience, firsthand experience with mental health conditions to make you uh, more aware, more accepting, more uh, desire for money and uh, tax dollars to be spent in this area. We asked a, a battery of questions in the June survey. A few of them were repeated again in our August survey to which we asked respondents if they agreed or disagreed. And you see a large majority response to everything here on the board except for question 21. And that is the state of Texas is spending tax dollars on mental health in an efficient and effective manner. Stands the reason that there's going to be a little bit more disagreement than agreement with this question considering the job that the state of Texas is doing in the area of mental health was at a net negative of minus 28 points, poor over excellent a few slides before this one. But you see a large majority, eight to nine out of 10 respondents are agreeing about some of these statements. For example, uh, question 15, within their schools, all Texas children should have access to the mental health services they need to be successful. Uh, we talked about active service uh, members. Two thirds of active service members strongly believe they will uh, be seen as weak if they seek or receive medical care. This indicates a need for more open discussion about mental health issues, 90% agree with that. Returning veterans are owed a special obligation to make sure they receive the care they need. 19 out of 20 voters in Texas agree with that statement. We asked um, in the uh, August survey uh, another battery of agree-disagree questions. And again, we saw a large majority agreement to them. Um, question uh, 23, the military needs to actively encourage servicemen and women to seek help for mental health conditions and do a better job of helping them get the help they need. Again, 19 out of 20 respondents are agreeing with that. 
Uh, we talked about children. We talked about uh, because of education. Uh, we talk about in, in incarceration issues in these in these statements, uh, whether they be some of the agree disagree statements or the more likely or less to spend money statements. This battery of questions, how it was asked, was for each statement I read you, please tell me if it makes you think that more or less tax dollars need to be spent in the area of mental health. And you can see the responses range from 7 out of 10 to 8 out of 10. Um, uh, question 31 was interesting. We received about the same responses, whether it was the X version asked the half the sample or the Y version. And there's a big understanding, uh, there's clear, clear understanding about the, the uh, early intervention uh, and the need to save some, some dollars if we could just, do, through early intervention, address uh, uh, mental health related issues. We would uh, keep more people out of prisons, studies show uh, we would make students more successful and be a more productive state than we already are. When we get to the end of the survey, we asked having heard more about it, do you think more or less needs to be spent? Uh, addressing mental health needs or situations, and we end up at 60 or 71 uh, percent. That's four points higher than where we started. Uh, we already started at a high majority, uh, saying that we needed to spend more in this area, and we increased it another four points. Um, some of the uh, items I will tell you that correlated the most with this, if I can go back a slide or two, um, are uh, I'm just going to mention two of them. I thought I just wanted to highlight two. If you didn't have any experience with mental health issues, or if you, let's say you did, let's start there. If you had experience with a close friend or family member with mental health conditions, then question 34 was very important. Uh, it was that uh, the statement at the bottom that state government and public institutions would provide an important service by addressing the stigma or sensitivities associated with mental health so that there are fewer barriers. Breaking down the stigma and the barriers in this discussion are very important to, to the foundation and the institute. Uh, it's, it's, it's critical that we can get people to talk about this, so then we can then take action a little bit easier. It turns out that that, question, that statement uh, not only correlates well with uh, getting individuals to want to see more spent on mental health issues if they have experience with a family member or friend uh, with one of those eight mental health uh, conditions. But it also is something that correlates very well with those who don't have any experience with a family member or a friend with a mental health condition. So for that reason, question 34 to us is what we consider an umbrella message. Beyond that, I'll just share two more with you. <clears throat> One is uh, question 33. Question 33, the state would save several hundred millions of dollars in lost economic productivity and wages if they would just deal with this in early, uh, through early intervention. Um, that uh, that hits home to somebody that has experience with a family member or a close friend with a mental health condition. If you are an individual who does not have that type of experience, then question 32 is one of those statements that works very well. And it's very specific to the prison inmate situation uh, and how early intervention can help there. No, notice that both statements deal with early intervention. One's a more broad topic, question 33, that goes across many areas economically and otherwise, where question 32 is very specific. The other one that worked very well for uh, correlation purposes with those that do not have much experience dealing with uh, family members or friends with mental health conditions was question 20 on the previous page. And that was, education of our children is an investment in our future to fully realize a child's potential. They should have access to the mental health services they need to be successful within their schools. Now, I'm just highlighting a few that had a little bit higher correlation than other statements, but we have a large majority agreeing to all these statements here. We ended up again, like I said, at 71% thinking more need to be spent on mental health related issues. Oop, I think I might have gone too fast with the clicker. Uh, so to summarize the, the same points that Andy brought up earlier, I'll turn it over to Andy for him to, to go through them. And I, of course, will stay on the line for questions. Andy? Thanks, Mike. And, um, you know, I think, again, you know, you can see here some of the main findings that we wanted to highlight to kind of frame the other issues. I'll just leave this uh, slide up, and, you know, I think we can go into questions and, you know, maybe wrap up a little bit at the end. But we do want to take questions. You all have been very patient. So, uh, 
let us know uh, if, you, if you have any. You know, it looks like we uh, haven't had it. Folks, feel free to use your uh, question um, option or the chat option to, uh, to ask me if you have them. But otherwise, uh, we'll just wait a couple minutes and maybe, Connie, we can flip over to the uh, end slide where, uh, you know, share some of the, or, or has our website information. You can certainly email us. Uh, uh, you know, you, I'm sorry, you can go to the site, texasstateofmind.org. There's a contact uh, there, um, my contact, other people's contacts there. We're happy to be uh emailed or other questions and like uh, we said earlier there's going to be press kits and this information will be sent out so folks have that. So um, I think I have uh, created enough time for people to ask questions if they have them. Mm -hmm. Oh we did get one question. So uh, we have a question of what are we going to do with this survey when it comes to the legislators now in session what specific policies uh, are we going to be advocating for? Well, I think well, we are going to be uh, uh, determining uh, the specifics, and we we do not endorse specific legislation. Uh, we see ourselves as being available for questions, uh, people who legislators who want uh, evidence of best practices, what works best in a specific area and how to, uh, let's say, garner local collaboration in a better way, how to determine metrics for what they want to accomplish. So we see ourselves as really a source of information that's nonpartisan, evidence-based, data-based, and that'll be our primary function in the legislature is really educating uh, legislators as to the issues when they need help and uh, the opportunity. So we have a, a related question. Uh, actually, there's a follow-up on that one. Let's go ahead and take that just to kind of finish that. Uh, the question is, what are some best practices that Texas isn't doing? And, uh, you know, that's a really good question. I'll jump on that one. You know, actually, there, there, there are actually are very few best practices that there isn't at least somebody in Texas doing it. You know, when we look across the state, um, we can find, for example, best practices like uh, school-based mental health programs that are, are operated, um, you know, again, it's, it's a place where the school wants it there, the principal wants to have those services available, the district wants it, and those services are available not just during the day, but they're available in the afternoons and evenings so parents can be involved. Um, they include consultation uh, to teachers and to support teachers because a lot of times children with behavioral health needs um, if they kind of manifest them more outwardly, can have a hard time uh, staying in class and often get expelled at higher rates. So those programs are happening in different parts of the state. The problem is almost any best practice we have, uh, another good one is assertive community treatment, which is used uh, for people with very intensive needs, uh, particularly to try to help folks quit using emergency rooms and inpatient facilities and jails too much. The problem is we, we have them in too few communities, and when we do have them, we have them available to too few folks. So we end up um, creating barriers like where we reserve those services for youth in the juvenile justice system because we, we that's really the only group we can have enough to serve. Or we reserve them for just the highest users within our mental health system when there's a whole bunch of other folks that are cycling through emergency rooms, through jails, through inpatient facilities. So a lot of times it's the scaling issues, um, and that certainly relates to workforce, but it also relates to the commitment um, at the state level to um, try to provide these services for more Texans. Uh, we have another question, um, which is for those who stated they didn't know where to go for mental health care, could it be that the majority of those people don't have the same resources and money as those who stated that they do know where they could go for help? Uh, and I think that's actually a very, uh, plausible hypothesis. I think that, you know, if you have uh, health care benefits, if you uh, have uh, the resources to be going regularly to a family doctor, if you um, are more linked into your health care systems, then yeah, you're going to have people you can look to. Um, but I think that it, it also speaks to the fact that we haven't done a good enough job making um, 
people aware of services that are there because you know services are there uh, through FQHCs, through community mental health centers, and a lot of times there's a real uh, bind that those agencies are in because they have so few resources they are not going to really advertise because they have plenty of people coming through the doors. Uh, we've actually worked with some communities where it's a real dilemma to to, to talk about you know how how do we make people more aware when if we do we're not going to be able to cope with the uh, with the needs. Um, and so I think that we often make it quite difficult in the way we design systems and the way that we underfund systems for, for people to access care. And I think that's uh, as much a barrier um, as it is that uh, people lack resources. I think we, we just do a poor job of making those resources available to folks. Uh, we have another question about Local planning and decision making uh, is one of the principles we talked about. How can a community go about bringing about local planning and decision making? Well, you know, we have some really good examples of how in the last couple of years um, communities can come together, and, and I, there's, there's several different ways. Um, one is if you look at the 1115 waiver, which was a special, <coughs> excuse me, arrangement with the federal government where we were able to get access to fund uh, innovation projects at the community level to try to divert people from overuse of emergency rooms, overuse of inpatient care. Communities across Texas came together in, in planning efforts and uh, you can find a study uh, on our website in our research section that the UT School of Social Work did at Austin that really looked out and found that were, you know, hundreds of programs were able to be developed. Uh, thousands of people were able to have increased access to care. So you can have collaboration like that between mental health, hospital uh, providers, as well as managed care organizations uh, that are responsible in the public sector for delivering care. Um, but, you know, it's not just in the public sector. We also see uh, various initiatives happening around uh, United Ways, um, uh, leaders in the community who are either philanthropists or uh, business community leaders who have an interest in mental health, bringing together groups that bring together faith-based uh, organizations, others, and so those sort of connections can be really helpful. I think one thing too that, that we can really do here at the Institute is, you know, we see this as our role, one of our most important roles, because while policy decisions are made at the state level, services are delivered at the local level. And right now we're working in literally dozens of communities across the state, you know, uh, Denton County, uh, Tyler, uh, Houston, uh, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, with local community uh, uh, collaboratives and providing consultation to them and guidance about how they can form, how they can be more effective, and how they can get services, uh, more services and more effective services to members of their communities. I um, have another question. Uh, let's contextualize exactly why you felt the need to do this survey. Could someone just explain how bad the mental health system is in Texas? Our listeners need to hear that to understand why this survey is even being done. Well, this is Tom Lees. I, I'd respond to that. I think, one, we uh, are very much aware that uh, the issue of so-called stigma uh, still exists in our society, and we wanted to see how real that was. Second of all, uh, because we still have hesitancy in talking about this issue, and that's unfortunate, but I think that still exists in our society. We wanted to be able to show local and public policy makers that the public, although they may not talk every day about it to their legislator, this is a very, very important issue and that people understand that it's a real issue. I mean, as Mike said in some of his charts that he showed you, I mean, this is top of mind to Texans and we want policy makers to know that. And then when you also analyze what we're doing, then you begin to have, uh, I think, the momentum built where local and state policymakers will uh, better address this issue. You know, I talked to one county judge, for instance, in the state who shared with me that, you know, he estimated there were about 2,000 people in his community, each of whom had been arrested 60 different times and put in jail and recycled in and out. Well, I mean, gee, I mean, not only is that a human tragedy, it's a cost tragedy. It lacks effectiveness. 
And it really shows what I think we have to communicate to the public, which is our mental health system for too long has operated on what I call an emergency room basis. And if, if there's an emergency, we're going to find a way to get you help. But we need a, a philosophy in this state that we need treatment before tragedy. So I think there are some fundamental changes in the system in addition to, you know, dealing with waiting lists and dealing with emergency room uh, visits and, and jail diversion. We also need to work over time to increase our workforce and to increase the understanding that we have to integrate physical and mental health into our health care system. And that'll take time, but this is an important issue and it needs to be addressed. Tom, can I add to that? This is Mike. Sure. Uh, you can also, for those in the press that are on that, that know some of the work that we've done before, it's not uncommon for us to have an initial and an informed position, such as we had here regarding how much uh, more or less dollars should be spent on mental health issues. We did not know, uh, without asking the question, uh, what the Texans thought. Uh, would it be you know, less than 50 percent, more than 50 percent? So when we found out that two-thirds were uh, believe that more needs to be spent, on mental health issues, that was a uh, again an initial point. But we also needed to find out, as Tom mentioned about, from a communication standpoint, what items of information need to be communicated to that correlate well with uh, the need to spend more in this area. And we found out that we we have more statements really to communicate than than we probably have uh, time in most situations to communicate them. You saw them all, and I think you're going to be. Uh, being able to pick up on those uh, and, and have a copy of those. Um, so we, we're, we're not short of material now to communicate, but now we know at least the reaction that uh, voters have to each of those very specific statements about early intervention, cost, and everything else. You know, Mike, on that point, you know, someone else had typed a question that's related about, was there anything that surprised you or jumped out? You know, you've done a lot of surveys. You've looked at a lot of uh, policy issues over the years, you know, what's, anything that struck you in particular about this, just, you know, as uh, someone who is probably as familiar as anybody with the minds of Texas voters? Well, there are two things. Um, let me see if I can go back to them. I don't know if I still have control of the mouse. I don't think, maybe I do. Uh, two things that stood out. Uh, one was looking how close uh, mental health issues, or I think it was depression, uh, the one at 62% came to um, cancer. Uh, sure, you know, it's not surprising to see a large percentage that knows someone who has had cancer. But uh, third on that list was uh, was depression. Um, and th that was a little surprising to me that we had that many admit that. And, then, and I don't know if we would have gotten the same 62% had we asked that question right at the beginning of the survey. Um, but th that was one surprise. The other one that, that uh, caught me by a little bit of uh, surprise was the majority of Republicans thinking that we need to spend more. Now, we're only at 16% of Republican primary voters spend less, but by a little over three to one, almost three and a half to one, even Republican primary voters think more need to be spent. And so uh, uh, I know how Republicans can be when it comes to spending dollars relative to their Democrat counterparts. And uh, they were, uh, that was a little bit of a surprise seeing them at the uh, low 50s numbers that we saw. Well, that's really helpful, Mike. You know, I would just add that, you know, here at the Institute, we're doing a lot of different studies, including one that's a collaboration with the Conference of Urban Counties to try to really quantify the impact on local governments, because we talk a lot about what's spent at the state. You know, there was a lot of, I think, uh, happiness over the increased funding at the state last session, um, you know, another $300 million for the biennium, $160 million for any given year. You know, that's really dwarfed, though, by the figures we're starting to see at the county level. You know, our current estimate is it's over $2.1 billion um, being spent at the county level for individuals with mental illness. Um, and, you know, three quarters of that is impact in emergency rooms, one, almost $1.5 billion in costs in local emergency rooms. Much, And this is, uh, you know, much of this uncompensated. Um, and then the $500 million, about half a billion dollars, the cost to the correctional system. So, you know, uh, in many ways, the, you know, we see more money being spent at the local level, certainly than through the formal behavioral health system um, at the state level. And uh, you know, that's, I think, a, a real motivator. And I think people are beginning to understand those impacts, both in terms of cost as well as in the impact on people's lives. Um, we have a couple follow-up questions. Um, Thank you.
So let's go to the next question by this person who has asked a couple questions. She has, does she have one balloon? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Then let's go back up. Um, so the other one is, is there hope for improvement? Have other states or communities improved their systems? Um, that is a really important question, absolutely. And, and there's communities in Texas that have improved their systems. Um, I think a great example is uh, uh, Tarrant County, which, um, you know, Fort Worth area. They, for years, uh, for the last several years, have had a group called Mental Health Connections that has really built uh, referral relationships, collaborative relationships between the schools, between um, JPS Health System, the local hospital district, um, the uh, MHM, MHMR of Tarrant County, which is the local uh, community mental health agency, substance abuse providers. And that's been, I think, a real uh, successful effort in getting people to work together better. You know, I think, too, you know, the state of Texas is nationally recognized for the work that it's done to build its crisis system. When uh, the Aurora shootings happened in Colorado, Colorado looked to two states as a guide to how to improve its crisis systems, and Texas was one. The uh, state has really, I think, led a, a very important initiative over the last several years, since 2007, to uh, spend hundreds of millions of dollars more on the crisis system. I think one of the unintended consequences of that is that we didn't really look at the, what do we do after crisis? As Tom said, our, our system is too crisis focused right now. So we respond in a crisis, but we don't have care to continue to treat people. And we have to recognize that these are, these are chronic illnesses more attuned, akin to diabetes than they are to um, you know, a, a car accident. It's not just that you intervene in an emergency and help someone get better. You really need to plug someone into care that's ongoing probably over a year or more, especially in severe circumstances where we're looking at multiple years. It's extremely treatable in the vast majority of cases, but we have to really make treatment available. Um, Andy, um, I'm going to yeah, go ahead, Mike. Like, good. Uh, and I, I finally shared that uh, the same uh, uh, story with you uh, the other day. Uh, but when I first sat down with Tom and started talking about this, um, uh, there was a lacrosse tournament uh, that we had experienced with our sons playing in Houston that was all set up around um, a, uh, a young man who had bipolar disorder who committed suicide. And the parents decided to take that tragic situation and try and bring awareness to bipolar issues through a lacrosse tournament that's held at the beginning of every lacrosse season. As a matter of fact, I think it's coming up in a week or so. And teams from all over the state come and play. And just think of that generation of young lacrosse players, boys and girls, getting a, a better understanding of bipolar dysfunction and bipolar disorder and, and learning more about it. It's something that, you know, we see races for the cure. We see... Uh, a lot of events that take place for physical conditions, but we don't have as many for mental conditions. And even these little things, I think, help to bring about awareness. Uh, we're just starting, but we need more of them. Yeah, I think that's really right on, Mike. And I think, too, you know, um, I think it points, too, that, you know, a lot of times our, our young adults, our youth, um, can help lead on this. I mean, I think there's a lot more comfort uh, that we see a lot around a lot of things that, you know, um, those of us who are older, you know, weren't raised in this comfort, you know, it wasn't as easy to talk about. And I think uh, it, there's reason to be hopeful. I think it's also interesting that if you compare two of the findings in the survey where you say, look at whether people perceive that they're, it's harder to talk about mental health than health, nine out of ten Texans perceive that it is. But if you ask them if they personally feel that it's harder to talk about mental health than mental health, it's actually only a minority that feel that way themselves. So it's interesting. People perceive that it's other people, at least that's how I interpret that, Mike, um, that other people have an issue with it, but they personally um, feel okay about talking about it, or at least they say they do on a survey. And I think that's an important um, variable to, to, to think about exploiting is how do we help people start talking about it and then begin to see, oh my gosh, there's a lot of other people out there that are comfortable talking about it too. I think there's, there's a difference in perception of whether people are receptive to how receptive Texas voters seem to be. And I don't know, would you interpret that differently, Mike? No, I think you're right on. There was another question that we asked in one of the other surveys. It might have been the June one where we asked if they were comfortable talking about mental health conditions as they themselves talking about mental health conditions as the physical ones. And you're right, we, we found a majority that, oh, oh, I can talk about these issues. But the question that you have on the board right now, the 9 out of 10 or the 80 percent that it's referring to, is that people believe others have a hard time talking about this. Yeah, I think that's right on. Well, there's a related question um, that someone asked about whether we found a difference in stigma and knowledge of resources 
between those who need long-term or short-term mental health care. And, you know, I've, I've, maybe, Mike, you can think about that. I've, I've been thinking about it for a couple minutes and went through out a couple thoughts. But, you know, we, we, we didn't really ask that question, but you can sort of get at it. You know, one thing we looked at was the number of, you know, Mike had a lot of analysis by the number of, of mental health conditions that people in your network have. So like the people who had, you know, seven or eight of those mental health conditions that they recognized in their network, there certainly was much more comfort and much more knowledge about where to, uh, about where to go among that group. Um, you know, the other group we looked at some more severe conditions like schizophrenia, for example, and, um, you know, I, you know I, I didn't actually see a real difference on some of those questions between schizophrenia, which is a long-term disorder, and uh, some of the other ones, it was more, I think, the, 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 what I was struck by, and Mike, maybe you saw it differently, it, you know, more was the, the number of folks in your network you were aware of. So, like, if you endorsed seven, eight, or nine conditions, then you were much more comfortable, much more knowledgeable. Correct. And, and along those lines, or something that was brought up earlier about uh, the access, knowing where to go, um, the tools that are available to somebody with lower incomes, relatively speaking, are, are not there with those with upper incomes. Um, when uh, we showed that table for question 12 earlier, uh, would you uh, know where to go? We had almost as many people under the eight with uh, incomes under $40,000 per year not knowing where to go as where to go. It was 46% of that income group did not know where to go, 53% knew where to go. If you look at $125,000 or more, 80% know where to go, only 18% don't know where to go. And you could say maybe it's a travesty that even almost one out of five individuals with upper incomes don't know where to go. But uh, clearly, those with lower, relatively lower incomes were over twice as likely, two and a half times more likely to not know where to go as someone with upper income levels. Um, yeah, I think that's right on, Mike. You know, and I, I think those are really powerful. It's interesting, you know, there is some research that um, actually shows some correlations between uh, vulnerability to mental health conditions and intelligence. So, I, you, know, I, it, you know, I think part of it's awareness, part of it's resources, but, you know, it may also be that, that um, there may actually be some increased prevalence among some, some aspects of our population, which I think is often counterintuitive. Um, but I think that's because we asked the question about family members. If we ask the question about, you remember, we're talking to voters here, a lot of times people themselves who have more severe mental illness are often very disenfranchised because, you know, if mental illness strikes, it's a disorder of adolescence and young adulthood. That's when it strikes, it, 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 especially in severe forms, um, and it knocks people off their developmental pathway. And so a lot of times people are in poverty and people, you know, are really disenfranchised and it's harder for them to access care. And we really need to think not just about you know, um, strategies with making this more available at your family doctor, but also how do we organize communities so that when people present in emergency rooms, so that when people present in jail settings, when people hopefully even earlier begin to have problems at school and teachers notice, um, we can get people to care sooner and we can more importantly keep them in care. Again, we need to move beyond a crisis system. You know, we had some questions come in about the safety net and how well the safety net is doing in our state. And I think we need to think about what happens after we grab people, after they fall and we catch them in the safety net. We actually are catching quite a few people on our safety net. Um, the question is, what do we do after that? Do we just sort of brush them off and say, good luck, you know, go, go, don't fall again? Or do we actually get them into services? And that's, you know, our estimates right now is that if you look at people with mental health needs, severe needs, I'm not just talking about, you know, a little bit of anxiety here and there, but severe mental health needs, under 200% of the federal poverty level, so people in you know, significant poverty with severe mental health needs, our estimate right now is that we fund somewhere around one in 10 of those folks at, at our public systems. That's how much money we put in. So you know, we really have the vast majority of folks uncovered after we catch them in the safety net, and that's, I think, really where folks need to be looking for solutions. It's not something we can do overnight. It's going to take a, a commitment over years, but let's make some incremental steps towards that, broaden our focus from just crises and hospitals and emergency rooms and really look at funding care for people to stay in that works. Um, so can I, does that look like we have all of our questions? Any other ones? You know, we're, we're not going anywhere. We're here at the, at the Mental Health Institute, and as Tom said, you know, we want folks to, uh, to uh, be able to, um, 
access us. If you have questions of the media, if others you know have questions, that we're a resource. So you don't hesitate to contact me directly, any member of our team, and we're uh, happy to uh, follow up and give you more information. We can get more information from Mike. Um, you know, anything you need. We really want to make sure the information is out there so people can be making good decisions. And again, you know, when we look to this legislative session, we see that as our role, is to be sort of an arbiter of information and data, to um, make sure that we're uh, providing that in an objective and nonpartisan way so that Texas decision makers can be informed about the issues, informed about the solutions, and able to make uh, decisions that, that better the lives of, of Texans across our state. Thank you all very much.